Welcome to This Is My Architecture. I'm Matt from AWS. Today we're in sunny Tel Aviv, Israel, and I'm joined by Delev from Trax. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. So we were talking before the shoot, and Trax has a lot of cool products and use cases. Uh, tell us about them. So at Trax, we digitize the physical world of retail. We take images of shelves, and we transform them into data. Okay, so when you say shelves, what do you mean? Like stores, warehouses, what, what are you talking about? So one of our customers gets into a supermarket, they take images of shelves, and then we uh, transform them into business metrics. For example, how many missing products are there, etc. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So you want to see what your stock is like, you know, what products are placed where, etc., mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And I imagine this is a manual process, or using some kind of intelligence or deep learning? Yeah, so we have our own proprietary deep learning algorithms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have different geometry-based algorithms, and we stitch images together to have really a comprehensive view of the shelf, of a long shelf. And we do everything here on the cloud, on AWS cloud. Great. So today we're going to talk about the factory. I love the name. Uh, it's running on AWS, and it looks like you have a collection of microservices here, right? Yeah, so the factory is the name we call, the nickname we give to our system. And it's actually a bunch of microservices. They all connect to each other. Uh, from the images, in the mobile, they really flow through the factory, they go through different stations, and the different stations are glued using SNS and SQS, which means each service publishes it finished to work, and then a different service gets it via SQS. Okay, okay. so these so are microservices running on EC2 and containers, how are you running them? So we're running on spots, okay. spot instances, and this entire factory really scales on demand. Great. So, you know, when we're talking about scaling, the first thing I'm going to ask you is at what scale? So, you know, how, how many images or at what scale are you operating today? So, we have millions of images per month, and this is a big scale for us because these stations, they don't work for just a short time. Yeah. Doing image recognition, stitching imaging together, that takes time. So, all these stations are working on large scale of images and stitching them together, recognizing. Okay, so at that scale, and yeah, there's a lot of sort of compute horsepower that goes into exactly. some of this processing. So you're going to need to scale up, and I guess scale in, uh, mm -hmm. often, right? Yeah, we do that very often. It could be GPU instances for recognition, and we do that. And what we do is usually, or what we did until now, we use the best basic metrics we have in CloudWatch on the queues themselves. For example, how many messages are available in the queue. And you can decide by that if you want to scale in or out. Okay, so yeah, like any good microservices architecture, you've decoupled them using message service, mm -hmm. in this case, SNS and SQS. Mm -hmm. But you didn't, you started that way, but you had to kind of change, right? So yeah. you were using, like many people, CloudWatch metrics around mm -hmm. SQS queue depth, mm -hmm. but why didn't that work for you? Well, there are some disadvantages that weren't good for us. For example, it measures the queue depth every five minutes. Okay. okay? This is what CloudWatch does. You can go through the API to SQS and ask it even in a faster interval. So we're now using a per second uh, interval for asking the queue depth, and we decide upon that. Oh, wow, okay. okay. So I guess in your case, why did it make a difference? Like, I guess five minutes is a long time between intervals, but specifically to your product, why, why did that make a difference? So for that, you need to understand the supply and demand. Okay. And we have here a graph which shows time and demand. And for us, the five minute interval is just not enough because you used to have a lot of fluctuation of images that's flowing into the factory. And what we did by uh, working per second is really adapting it as close as possible to the demand graph, okay, the supply graph. And we used to maintain a small buffer, which is just enough for us to scale in case there is a big inflow of images. Okay, so I have some questions there, but you know, the first thing to jump to mind too is what you're effectively saying is five minutes in that time, the queue depth information becomes stale, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what happens if you have a scaling incident and you take something out of commission? You mentioned before that you know, these GPU-backed uh, image processing algorithms, for example, they can take a while to process. So mm -hmm. what if something is mid-flight and you take away that instance? What happens? So this was another motivation for us to do this shift, and this is happening for us in, in cases where a machine is really working and we downscale it. Yeah. And if that happened, uh, uh, we're losing work that is done and we have to wait until the visibility timeout of the queue, which returns the message back and then we can take it. And that affects our SLAs. So to prevent that, we're using what AWS Fleet feature has, which is protecting. Okay, so you prevent the instance from being scaled in, from yeah. being called. Yeah. yeah, the instance itself then declare it's just been taking a message, mm -hmm. it needs to be protected, and we protect it for the exact time of the visibility timeout, because in case we have a really unhealthy instance, we'll be able to 
uh, both get the message back into the queue after the visibility timeout and to a discharge of the uh, a unhealthy That's instance. interesting. So just to make sure I understand, you're, you're protecting the instance for as long as the message timeout is, so it's that you protected. align those two metrics. Yeah, Interesting. exactly. I like that approach. So getting back to the supply and demand graph over here then, you know, how you protect the instances and so you don't take something that is processing or doing a job, that makes sense to me. You know, another thing though, when you're moving beyond five minute scaling intervals to, I think you said per second, right? Exactly. What I often see with customers is that when you start, you know, having metrics so tight, there's the risk that you're going to add or remove capacity all the time. You know, we, we call that thrashing sometimes. How do you avoid thrashing like that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we don't have to decide to act every second. We measure the queue every second, but then we open a window, and in this window we allow the number of service to, to go. And if we decide that we see that the demand really increases and it's out of the window, only then we add more machines. Um, you did mention also though that you can use the SDK and you can actually measure queue depth outside of CloudWatch by, by hitting mm -hmm. SQS. So are you deciding when to scale based on queue depth alone or are you using other metrics? So we're using other metrics because we're using our own service, which really is outside the factory. So this service can go and ask SQS what is the queue depth, but it could also ask what are, how many messages are in flight. And then we can combine them together to use a new scaling metric, and we're scaling by the uh, sum of these two metrics. Interesting. So in addition to sort of having this auto scaling 2.0 service that, that has uh, sec uh, second level uh, scaling, you're also combining two metrics instead of the one QDEP metric. Yeah, because the QDEP itself has some disadvantages. The biggest one of them all is you can have a zero QDEP, but your supply would be exactly the number of your demand. And if something happens and you see it's zero, so you decide to uh, scale in. And when you scale in, you lose a machine and then you're, you need to really thrash by adding more machines. So you're looking at messages in flight in addition to QDAP, those two metrics. This is give you the actual demand. Okay, so this all makes sense. The one question I have for you though remaining is that when I see <laughs> a service up there, you know, that in your case hitting SQS API and deciding, uh, gathering that additional data you need for mm -hmm. scaling, uh, our CTO Werner Vogel says all, that everything fails all the time. So what happens when this service fails? Does it stop scaling? What's your backup plan? So we have a backup plan. The backup plan is we have an even larger window, which is controlled by the basic CloudWatch metrics. So we have the scaling policy that we used to have, and it kicks in whenever our service fails. Oh, okay. So because the window is bigger and you're using CloudWatch with, with AWS auto scaling, mm -hmm. um, it, it'll naturally gravitate to that and they won't step on each other. You're not using the same window or interval. For both. Yeah. So if we lose our service, eventually we'll scale uh, up as needed. Okay, and if it comes back, it's doing per second, so it'll catch up as well within exactly. the five-minute interval. Exactly that. So I, I like a lot of things about this architecture. I like how you're able to meet your customer SLAs, you know, move quickly, add capacity quickly to sort of meet demand. Uh, I also like how you've extended and enhanced our platform by building your own, I said earlier, auto-scaling 2.0 service, if you will, that uh, takes into account more uh, metrics and, and also does scaling on a per-second basis. It's pretty innovative. It's nice to see. Thank you. Thanks for sharing it with us. And thanks for watching. This is my architecture.